The following is an audiobook presentation of How to Bury Your Goods by Eddie the Wire, a small booklet originally published by Loom Panics Unlimited, and now re-released for free in audio and PDF format. If you'd like a revised, updated paperback edition that does exist via Paladin Press, who acquired a number of Loom Panics books when they went defunct. Hence, why no paperback via Liberty under Attack Publications? Find the book for free by visiting bonupodcast.com slash berry. Again, bonupodcast.com slash berry to get this short, yet highly valuable work. Finally, for more great books like this, view our full catalogue by visiting libertyunderattack.com. Thank you for being here, please enjoy. Forward. Although all of the techniques described in this book will work, neither the author nor the publisher assumes any responsibility whatsoever, either actual or implied, for any consequences, damages, claims, or faults resulting from use of the information in this book. After a review of the literature connected with hiding things and concealment, I found little material actually discussing burying and storing things, and methods of avoiding detection. This book is specifically written to fill in the gaps in that knowledge. It is a complete how-to-do-it book for anyone who wants to securely package and bury just about anything. Included are accessible technology for preservation, burial site selection and relocation, burial techniques, and more. Since this book is written with the average person of average resources in mind, some techniques that require a lot of support are not listed. This book is the home workshop approach, and it will work just as well as more expensive methods. At this time, I would like to extend a sincere thanks for the assistance and support offered by Loom Panics Unlimited in making this book possible. A final note, bury now. The situation can only get worse, and money tighter. Do it now or not at all. Eddie the Wire. Chapter 1, What Do You Have to Hide? What you should bury what do you have to hide? For starters, almost anything. The contents of your safe deposit box, mortgage and insurance papers, birth certificates, and other materials for that alternate identity you may need in a hurry, some of the more interesting books in your collection, and so on. What about gasoline and ammunition? During the recent Miami riots, Federal and state law enforcement agencies prevented the sale of both items in a wide radius that extended around the riot center. If I were caught in such a mess, I would want large amounts of both of the above. Other items that would be of value for use or barter in a crisis slash shortage slash collapse situation are prepackaged garden seeds, these are sold in special survival editions packed in nitrogen, dehydrated, nitrogen packed or freeze dried foods weapons and ammunition, reloading equipment and powder, primers, ever try to make a primer. And shot slash bullets for same, warm clothes and outdoor sleeping bags, camping equipment, compasses, tents, extra bottled gas, kerosene, gasoline, motor oil, rope, hand tools, knives, medical supplies including bandaging materials and topical antiseptics, explosives, not as difficult as you might imagine, matches and lighters, candles, spare eyeglasses, the list is endless. Note that many of these things would be just sitting around anyway gathering dust, so why not put them where they are safe and out of the way. Many other items can be hidden, including things you are not supposed to have like silencers, homemade firearms of any kind, illegal modifications of factory arms, infernal devices, forge and altered ID, illicit drugs, a four-foot deep stash cures the habit, stocks of poisons, Richard Nixon buttons, and so on. Arrange your caches in sequence of need once you have decided what items are likely to be important to you, try to decide on groups to put them in so they can be cached in sequence of need. The first out group should contain weapons for self-defense and medical supplies, and some essential survival gear. The next group could be non-essential camping supplies, tools, rope, and food. The last group should contain items that require support facilities, such as reloading equipment, paper of any kind, and everything else you need but can get by without for a couple of days. 
Essential versus non-essential items now decide if some of these items are really essential, often the backpacker on his first trip will take everything he or she thinks will be needed, and uses only 25% of the stuff. For those items that fall into that class, consider some above ground storage. It will not be as secure, but it is much easier, and doesn't add to the cost of storage containers. Chapter 2, Burial Containers. Commercial containers now that you have decided what to bury, the next question is what to put it in. The commercial market abounds in burial containers, some good, some not, some rip-offs. Some are resealable, and some must be cut open once they are sealed. Generally, the commercial types fall into these three categories. 1. The long, thin kind that are essentially seamless plastic pipe with end closures. 2. The army surplus ammo cans, surplus scope cases, etc. 3. The industrial type containers marketed as burial containers. All three types provide both atmospheric and mechanical protection for a wide variety of conditions, but by with caution, especially the surplus stuff, since gaskets may have dried out long ago and require additional attention. If you have ample funds to buy containers for all the things you want to cash, by all means, do so, but buy one for a sample before investing in 10 or 20. Make sure the dimensions of the container will suffice for your larger items. Making your own burial containers if you have some time and want the very best in protection, it is a good idea to make your own containers. For starters, let's consider the PVC pipe container. The only problem with PVC pipe is how to make the end closure both simple and cheap. As pipe bombers know, end caps can easily run up a big bill, and they are non-reusable. If your cash is a one-time thing, resealing may not be important, however. Sealing the PVC container an easy way to avoid the high cost of end caps is to buy the following materials. A one quarter inch thick sheet of plexiglass cement for same, note, must bond plexiglass to PVC. A length of PVC pipe suitable for the size and number of objects a 5 inch long piece of PVC pipe in the next larger size that will exactly slip fit over the mother pipe PVC cement PVC pipe comes in pounds or strength ratings, 100 pound pipe sized inches in diameter is best, although it goes higher and lower. To make the end closure, cut off the mother pipe, allowing 2 extra inches for the seal. An easy way to determine how much pipe is needed is to experimentally pack it before cutting. Be sure to cut the end off square, a radial arm saw or mitre box is best. Now cut a two and a half inch piece of the larger pipe and glue as shown in figure one. Use the other piece of larger pipe to trace circles on the plexiglass, a sharp compass point or scale will produce a good line on plexiglass. Cut two round end plugs. A coping saw or sabre saw works quite well, using a blade with a lot of teeth per inch, 10 to 12, for a finer finish and to avoid chipping the plexiglass. Glue one of the plexiglass circles on, pack the pipe, put a tight paper wadding in the end and glue in the other plug. Be sure to preserve, bag, and tape a couple of hacksaw blades to the outside of the mother pipe for easy opening. Making the PVC container some brands of magic marker will permanently write on PVC, and these can be used to mark the paper wadded, and therefore cuttable, end with the contents. The writing may be further protected by duct tape. Resealable containers What if your cash must be resealable however? An easy solution to this is a threaded pipe sleeve and cap arrangement. Putting plumber's pipe dope or former gasket on the threads ensures a tight seal. An even lower cost system for pipe closure is simply a tapered bottle, drinking glass, or soda pop bottle, and silicone cork. Find a smooth walled glass container that will wedge fit into the end of the mother pipe, and seal this in with a generous application of silicone cork. For increased protection, a pipe sleeve protector will guard the glass plug from damage. If you enclose a tube of cork and a scraping tool in the pipe, it can be resealed at once. The cork can be smoothed and molded without sticking by wetting your finger first, then using it to smooth the cork. Containers for larger items okay, but what if some of your items are bigger than pipe sized? 
For this problem, my favorite answer is the five-gallon burger biggie pail that they ship pickles and condiments in. These have a cut-off seal, but will seal airtight repeatedly. If you buy some of these, make sure the rubber gasket is still there. Also available from restaurants and bakeries is the smaller number 10 size pail with snap fit lid, and glass or plastic jars with metal screw on lids. All of these restaurant containers should be further sealed by enclosing in at least two large garbage bags. If you use glass, face the fact that ground pressure is substantial and may break the glass. Small mason jars have a better cross section however, and are usually okay. Larger containers can be placed in a mechanical protector box cobbled together from wood. In fact, one very good improvised system is a wooden box tightly built and covered with driveway asphalt topping, or any waterproofing tar, or roofing cement. This is especially good if your resources are very limited. At the top end of the scale are the industrial containers, usually made of structural plastic and specifically designed for airtight storage. Locate these by asking at industrial supply and mill supply stores. Try the yellow pages. Chapter 3, How to Pack Your Goods into Storage Containers. Double packing we just covered pipe and larger containers. The next consideration is how to pack items within these containers. The amount of double packing you want to do depends on the item, and how good the mother container is. To hedge your bets, try to double wrap all items not well protected. I would wrap a handgun, but not a bottle of aspirin. For ease of wrapping, the commercially available heat sealable bags and sealer designed for freezer storage of food are excellent. Instructions for these sealer systems state that ordinary Ziploc bags can also be sealed, though not with as good success as the bags designed for use with the sealer. Try a sample and see what you think. You may be satisfied with just the Ziploc bag seal alone. In any event, some rules apply to all thin film sealing. Tape or otherwise cushion all sharp edges for obvious reasons, and styrofoam beads and hand squeezing immediately prior to sealing will help to eliminate excess airspace. A label on the bag may also be helpful. Displacing air to displace air and provide a non-corrosive atmosphere, inert gas can also be used, either in the bags or in the larger containers. Carbon dioxide can be generated by mixing vinegar and sodium bicarbonate and the resulting gas can be collected in a large garbage bag, as shown in figure 2, to be later dried and squeezed or poured into the container. Freon gas, a good source is the automobile air conditioner recharge kits commonly available, can also be used. To use Freon, insert a plastic or copper tube to the bottom of the container, as shown in figure 3, and pack as usual. When full, pipe the Freon to the bottom of the container via the pipe, and stop when a match held at the container mouth is extinguished by the inert gas. Then, quickly remove the pipe and seal. Again, the use of styrofoam plastic packing beads will help take up air space. Another good double packing technique for small parts is to simply wrap them in duct tape envelopes created by putting the objects in the center of the tape, and folding sticky side over to sticky side. Burp the container slash envelope well and smooth down the edges. For delicate items that are easily crushed, pill bottles may be the answer, as long as the seal is dependably airtight. Preventing rust now let's talk about rust protective coatings. WD-40 and similar spray type coatings simply will not provide the type of long-term protection you need. The coating must be thick, so Vaseline and Cosmoline are the best choices. For large-scale metal preserving, it is better to buy a lot of Cosmoline and tip the pieces in a tank of melted Cosmoline. For smaller operations, the pieces can be preheated until they are too hot to hold, then melted Cosmoline brushed on. Remember that Cosmoline will dissolve or mar many plastics, and will soak through paper and cardboard. Vaseline is used in much the same way, and may be melted together with some beeswax or paraffin to stiffen it. Do not use straight paraffin as a covering, it is too brittle. It is very important that any firearms preserved with Cosmoline or Vaseline be thoroughly cleaned before firing, 
especially the boar. Failure to do this results in an exploding weapons, which is never a lot of fun. Once the object is treated with a cosmoline or Vaseline coating, it should be mechanically protected by wrapping in aluminium foil or heavy paper wrap, otherwise, the grease will wipe off. One other coating for metal objects can be made by dissolving some of the plexiglass you have left over from making pipe end caps. Dissolve it in a small amount of acetone to make a liquid plastic coating. Add either more plexiglass or more acetone to get a consistency like honey. Items dipped in this coating and allowed to dry are well preserved. Desiccants The final item in your survival container is optional, it is called a desiccant. Chemicals like anhydrous calcium sulfate and silica gel are called desiccants because they absorb water vapor from the air and keep metals from rusting and leather from molding. Let me emphasize that this is good only for water vapor in the container before sealing, since a leak in the container will introduce too much water. Desiccants like the above are available from many suppliers. Some offer desiccants with an indicator which changes color depending on the amount of water vapor the chemical has absorbed, its readiness. If you use desiccants, remember two rules. First, keep the desiccant away from direct contact with anything, since the water does not disappear, it just goes to the chemical and any metal in contact with the desiccant will rust badly. Secondly, do not store paper and desiccants together, since the paper depends on water content for consistency. Inadvertently, I discovered that piano manufacturers ship their pianos from Japan with two or three half-pound bags of silica gel in the bottom, try to get a couple of these. Additional hints, some general comments are in order here. All packing procedures, and especially the Cosmoline Vaseline system, should be accomplished with surgical or cloth gloves on. Surprisingly enough, Many professional crimes are solved by the FBI finding a matchable fingerprint on a bomb fragment or tool, so don't leave your calling card on a cache that may be discovered. Also, labeling each small envelope is a good idea, and put a list of the complete container's contents inside for a check. Marking container outsides was previously discussed, as was providing opening tools preserved and strapped to the outside of the mother container. Chapter 4 location of the burial site. What to look for in a cache site where to locate your cache site is very important. Those who live on five or more acres may consider just sitting somewhere on their land, but the risk of detection is high. The best bet for the rural, urban, and suburban dweller is a site located at least 10 miles from a population center, such as a small town, but accessible by two or three country roads or trunk lines, and no more than 30 miles from home. Access by little used country roads may be important in cases of civil emergency and enforced travel restrictions. Rather than waste gas and time looking for likely spots, get copies of topographical maps of the surrounding 30 mile radius. Also try to get copies of country road maps, and a plat map if possible. Real estate agents may be able to help you with the latter, and possibly all three. You are looking for a forested area, wilderness area, swampy ground, rough, or rocky terrain, desert with prominent landmarks, farm field, little used graveyard, or other likely areas. Be sure to check road access and ownership of any likely areas that appear after a close study of your maps. Once you have three or four possible areas in mind, you are ready to visit each one. Equipment needed for each visit. Canteen with water or Gatorade insect repellent heavy coveralls, if underbrush will be encountered quarter inch steel or wood push rod with a sharpened end and an improvised handle non-stretchable line or tape, at least 200 feet long Polaroid camera, optional. Equipment for your cover activity, pressing wildflowers, photography, etc. Quality orienteering compass topographical map of area, 1 colon 24, scale. Paper and pencil pack to carry all of the above. Approaching the site as you approach the actual site by car, do a routine security check. Either stop for 15 or 20 minutes at a place that allows observation of the road behind you and look for familiar cars, or if you are in the suburbs, 
the old circle two blocks routine will disclose followers. At this stage, company is not likely, though, for two-tenths of a mile on each side of the access to the proposed site, while still on the road, look for a convenient parking place that will seclude your transportation from view. Four-wheel drive vehicles should also look for such places, since it does compromise security to put tire tracks up to the cash site. If you find a good spot, park and walk to the site. Your exact point of entry from the road, or other convenient area, should be noted, write it down or even flag it, and compass bearings taken from that spot to the proposed site. If your proposed area is very large, plan a triangular or straight in slash straight out tour by the compass. Don't get lost. If you are not familiar with orienteering procedures, I recommend the book The Expert with Map and Compass by Bjorn Kjellström, published by Scribner's. Specific recommendations for the triangular or in and out tour are given there, as well as compass selection criteria. If you don't have the book, just find your place on the map, find where you want to go, place a straight edge over these two points, and then draw a line. Now, with a protractor, find the difference in degrees between this line and north on the map and go along that heading using the compass. Specific site selection Specific site selection is a combination of many things. The first and most important consideration is ground condition. Is the ground damp now? Will it be damp if a sudden summer downpour hits? Is the soil well drained or does it hold water? Lots of pine trees indicate sandy soil, while hardwoods live best in loam and clay. Also, a lack of large vegetation may mean underlying rock. You must consider access, too. Will snowdrifts completely obliterate your landmarks in winter? Can snow drift on the site? And so on. Weather bureaus have information available on local prevailing winds that will allow you to calculate where drifts may build up. Available landmarks are also a consideration. A site with large rocks at triangular locations is easy to relocate, while one on flat bare ground is not so easy. Another consideration is how liable the site is to being built on. A real estate developer's access road laid down in two days can really put a kink in your plans, so try for a lousy building site. Underlying structure may also cause problems, so try to avoid immediate roadsides and their attendant power, gas, sewer, telephone, and water lines, unless you are intending to do a decoy site, in which case you should have a medium-sized BFO metal detector, can be rented, to find the lines and bury your container under the line. If you like this strategy, try to avoid possible junction sites, phone pedestal blocks and tie-ins, pipe tees, etc., and locate and dig in the long stretches of pipe. On your tour, any possible locations can be temporarily marked with a bright colored object. After you have completed the initial look over, select one best site and an alternate. Both these sites should be well checked for underlying rock or hard structure with the pointed push rod. Triangulating and documenting the site now fix one end of your marking tape to a prominent non-removable landmark, remember, trees get cut, and run it to the exact site, making a knot in the cord at that point. Now leave the cord and run another cord from another prominent landmark at an angle of at least 30 degrees from the first cord, see figure 4. This triangulation will allow pinpoint location when your memory is fuzzy. If you have a Polaroid camera with you, Take pictures of both landmarks and the general area. In any case, make a complete sketch of the area. The dullest pencil remembers better than the sharpest mind. Also remember to mark the knotted cords well. Once both first and alternate sites are triangulated and documented, do another simple security check. Look and listen for 15 to 20 minutes for visitors. If the coast is clear, Start back to the entry point that you marked previously. In other words, start on the last leg of your triangular or out and back path, but try to pace off the exact distance you travel. A double step or one pace, left right, usually equals 5 feet. 
This will provide further documentation for your further efforts. Finally, when you are back at the entry point, try to positively mark this in some way, and proceed to the car, see figure 5. Finding suitable landmarks If you have trouble finding suitable prominent landmarks, you may want to find a very distant, but distinctive set of landmarks, say a house a half mile away, and a peculiar shaped rock formation. Stand on the site and take exact compass bearings of each feature and record them. These will provide a fairly accurate bearing, but not as precise as the tape slash triangulation. Pictures will greatly aid this type of site location. Back at your vehicle, place a flag that will guide you to the spot again, and then leave. Try to attract no attention at all, make your cover activities prominent. Chapter 5, The Actual Burying Process Needed tools and equipment prior planning will eliminate many problems in the actual burying process. First of all, the proper tools and equipment. Heavy garden gloves pointed spade pickaxe, if hard pan or heavy clay is going to be a problem. Insect repellent 2 plastic ground covers 6 feet square and very thick packing or carrying equipment, if the burying containers are heavy or numerous flashlight, if a night burying. Day versus night burying if you bury at night, it is harder to navigate and locate the site, but the risk of detection is much less. A day or twilight burial may be the best compromise. The phase of the moon will also be a consideration. How long will IT take? A rule of thumb in the building trade is to allow a yard three of dirt per man hour. If it is heavy clay or you are out of shape, add a lot of time. If it is a multiple bury, also add time. It may be better to use both sites and bury on two different days. The starting time is at least 12 hours from the actual bury, when you load the equipment in the car or truck. The more separation between load time and trip time, the better. Starting out, it is always better to take time for another security check. Once clear, head for the transportation drop-off point, park, and get out. Now observe for 10 to 15 minutes, and if still clear, unload and start for the access point. Try to use the flashlight as little as possible, navigate in complete darkness if you can. The 10 or 15 minute observation period will help you get your night vision. From the access point, take bearings and head for the burial site. Once you arrive and locate the burial site, make another security check by sweeping the perimeter. This extra 10 minute walk is additional insurance against visitors, who may be on the far side of the burial site. Those burying gold or weapons will appreciate the necessity of keeping the burial site an absolute secret. Digging the hole finally, it is time to dig. You want the minimum sized hole, of course. Put the burying container on the site, and in the position desired, on its side, straight up and down, on an angle, or whatever, and begin to cut around the container with the spade, allowing a 6 inch clearance on all sides. Go down about 8 inches or so. Once this sod or dirt plug is completed, remove the container and carefully undercut the plug with the spade, eventually levering it out of the ground. Very carefully place this plug on one of the plastic ground cloths and drag it far enough away to allow for working room. In high brush this may be difficult, but not impossible. Then spread the other ground cloth near the projected hole location and begin digging the hole. Take a break every now and then and remember your canteen of water. Try not to drop any soil off the plastic ground cloth, since that is what it is there for. Finally, you will get to your required depth, whose subject is covered in detail in chapter 6. Place the container in the hole, in its proper position, and start to pack the dirt around it. Put in a layer at a time and then pack, this method will eliminate settling. Finishing touches when the soil level is such that the plug will be back at its original height, stop packing and reinstall the plug with extreme care. No trace of your berry should show. Especially not loose dirt, rocks, or heavy marks in earth or vegetation. The safety of your cache will depend on your taking meticulous care in this final few minutes. 
Any extra soil should be wrapped up in the ground cloth and carted away from the site, preferably even home with you. At this point, one cache is secure. If you are still strong, and you have planned a multiple berry, proceed to the next point and after security checks, do the next berry. If you find out just how hard it is to dig, you may wish to postpone the rest of the berry until next time. In any event, you will be ready to go home eventually. Repack all of your equipment and return to the access point, then to your vehicle. Running without headlights is tough, but another piece of the security picture. If you have a fairly secure location, the next chapter may be skipped, and you are done. If not, however, read on about decoys and arrays. These, by the way, should be planted at a much later date, at least, 10 days lag time. Chapter 6. How to protect your cache from discovery. Cache security lets assume the worst, 20 Nazi stormtroopers and 20 BATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, agents armed with metal detectors are out to find your buried cache. If you have buried at a site remote from your land by at least 3 miles, forget worrying because it is impossible to effectively search that much land. If, however, you had to cache closer than that, even in your own 5 or 10 acres, some sort of decoy array may be in order. Let's talk cache security. First of all, your packing techniques should have been accomplished with gloves on so no latent or thermoplastic fingerprints were transmitted that will connect you to the cache if it is found. Also, I assume you have not put in little notices like, if found, please return to, or any other physical addresses or clues. Second, nobody can find what they are not looking for, so don't tell anyone you are burying anything. Try to explain the absence of your beloved M16 with a plausible cover story, hide this book, and in general provide no hint of any burying activities. How metal detectors work now, let's examine how metal detector works, since any reasonable effort to locate your cache would have to be accomplished with the aid of such a search device. Any substance that can conduct electricity will produce a response signal on a metal detector. Even highly mineralized ground, or ground saturated with salt water, will respond positively although no actual metal is present. Metals also vary in their conductive activity, copper being 60 times as conductive as iron, that's why they use it for wiring, and hence shows up strongly on the detector. Not only does the type of metal and background signal created by ground conductivity affect signal response, distance from the detector coil to the target, depth of burial, and the overall size of the target are important. An iron pipe, buried end-on is much harder to detect than one buried flat. Since the average operator sweeps the area and then re-sweeps at right angles, a long pipe will surely show up, but not a smaller target like a pipe end-on. Factors that do not affect detector efficiency include shielding by metal, actually worse, or other non-conductive materials, unless they put distance between the detector and the target. Clearly then, the problem is to provide maximum depth minimum target area lowest conductivity. Depth of effectiveness published rules of thumb as to effective metal detector penetration must be related to the target size. In general, if the detector can identify a target area of 2 square inches at 3 feet, at 6 feet, double depth, the target area must be squared to cause a similar response. Some highly specialized detectors of the transmitter receiver type can locate objects with a target area of 2 square feet, at a depth of 10 feet. Artificial and natural decoys and arrays clearly, if a metal detector is going to be evaded at all, either the target area must be very small, the object buried very deep, or some decoys must be used, either natural or created. Natural decoys would include heavily mineralized ground, graveyards or farm animal pens, also highly mineralized, junkyards, scrap heaps, and so on. Also included under natural decoys would be utility lines, telephone lines and so on. If you locate one of these, Burying under the line may be very smart. Any operator will dig up part of the line and then disregard any other linear signal in the area. Artificial decoys are two types, either deep and specific, 
or shallow and background. Let me say at the outset that the more specialized types of detectors that search for deep objects will be able to overcome small generalized objects, and even ignore them completely. If you are a treasure hunter, this is not desirable since coins will be completely missed. If you anticipate any amateur searches however, an array of background non-specific decoys would be good insurance. For both amateurs and professionals alike, deep specific objects are good decoys. Scattering small pieces of copper on the ground is an easy and efficient way to produce a high background signal on any searcher's detector. Copper nails or bits of copper wire are excellent for this purpose. Avoid small pieces of iron since the conductivity is so much less. The more pieces per unit of ground, the higher the background signal intensity. Furthermore, such a signal can mask a weak signal from a deep buried object. Also, remember that once the copper is scattered, it cannot be easily removed, and so cannot be easily countered. A more expensive way to produce a background signal is to scatter pennies. This is good in that it seems innocent, if discovered. Remember that making a generalized signal array will immediately attract the attention of any operator. They are trained to look for the unusual, and to quickly determine the extent of any field quickly. The detector operator must then decide if an object is really buried in all that array. If the object cannot be distinguished from the background array, and the array is large, he has a lot of digging ahead, and for all he knows, there may not be an object at all. You may have cached, 20 miles away, and arrayed your lawn. Of course, if the search crew has a backhoe, you may wind up with a gravel pit instead of a lawn. It is a classic case of strategy whether or not to bury in an array, or away from one. Using specific deep targets as decoys, specific deep targets are detected by their electrical perimeter, not their actual mass. With this in mind, a cheap way to make a set of specific targets is to get the following. 50 feet of residential 2 conductor no ground plastic jacketed wire, 14 gauge 2 twist on wire nuts for each target desired vinyl electricians tape sturdy wire cutters jacket stripper wire stripper the jacket stripper slits the outer thermoplastic covering. These handy work savers are purchased at electrical specialty stores. Determine how many targets you are going to bury, and find a circular form at least 18 inches in diameter. Water heaters, clothes baskets, drums, etc., are all possible forms. Run wire around the form, one turn for each target desired, and cut the end just opposite the starting end. Now take the wire roll at four positions, and then cut through the wire at the two ends, the final result being a bundle of wire all of the same lengths. Now comes the hard work, each end and two leads must be stripped, and the ends electrically connected, black to black and white to white using wire nuts. If you have extra time, tape the complete connection against underground corrosion. These completed wire inductance loops can be formed into long and narrow rectangular or circular shapes. You may even want to try to duplicate the target outline that your burying container will present to the metal detector. In any event, each target must now be placed at least 18 inches below the ground, either using the previously described sanitary digging procedure, or even better, leaving a few telltale signs for a further decoy effect. Such deep specific targets can be placed in a background signal array, or by themselves. The lay of the land and the likely searching effort and pattern will determine what kind of combination of array you should use. It can be a good exercise in tactics. You may even wish to rent a metal detector with a fairly large coil, and observe the various reactions you get with your array and specific targets. One technique that is useful for burying the deep specific targets involves plunging a trenching shovel into the ground and working it back and forth to get a wedge-shaped opening, then moving down one shovel's width and repeating. Eventually, a complete trench can be outlined to any simple shape, and the wire loop easily buried. Plunging the spade around the initial trench will help to reclose the hole, and the damage is not noticeable. Above all, Remember that the best covering scheme is to make the possible area so large that any effective location program is impossible. 
If you set out on foot with a bar of gold and a shovel, the radius to be searched is much smaller than if you set out in a car with 20 gallons of gas and a road map. Ideally, nobody even knows you bury things, and so nobody looks. Chapter 7, Miscellaneous Considerations This last chapter deals with some loose ends that require brief mention. First of all, why did you bury what you did? If you went to the trouble to secure your cash, it should not be exhumed except when you are absolutely ready to use it. Merely digging it up proves nothing except that it is either not there or it still is. If it still is, your second visit has compromised security, and if not, there is no recourse, so maintain security. Now, let's assume that you are caching survival or military supplies for use under serious conditions. How about putting the necessary tools for opening and carrying out your cache in a separate easily opened container strapped to your first container? Tools are not always available in a desperation situation. That is why the maximum radius for home to burial site is 30 miles, in a pinch, it can be walked. If you have extra space in a burial capsule, consider putting in some materials that are good to have, but not entirely necessary. This assumes, of course, that the other contents of the capsule and any preservation methods are compatible with the additions. Capsule packing is also important. I would put my foods and weapons in the first capsule and the Van Gogh prints down in a different capsule. Appendix I, special section on machinery and gasoline storage. Boy, have you got problems. Storing and effectively hiding large items, such as offset printing presses, automatic and semi-auto reloading presses, metal cutting lathes, gasoline slash diesel powered electric generators, etc., and storing liquid fuels, both require special technology. Let's discuss the easiest first. Gasoline storage Gasoline from the pump has many additives depending on the type, time of season, and so on. To prevent these from coming out of suspension and causing deposits, a commercially available system must be used when storing petroleum products for long term. Loom Panics Unlimited has an excellent pamphlet on the subject, together with addresses for preservation chemicals. The actual storage is not difficult. Try to use an all plastic container with a good gasket or liner on the cap. If the liner is pulp and plastic, cut circular liners from cork sheeting, available at hardware or fishing supply stores and make a gasket. Always transfer petroleum products to storage containers in a well-ventilated area. Allow about one inch of air space at the top for expansion, and duct tape the cap on. Provide a dating and contents label as per instructions earlier in this book. If the container is all plastic, pool chemicals come in bottles that may be good for this, it can be buried very shallow without risk of detection. Since the container is well filled, ground pressure will not bother it. Storing machinery and other large metal objects Large metal objects present the greatest difficulty in protection and concealment. If a sufficiently large and sealable industrial plastic container is not available, I suggest building a sturdy wooden box with a strong framework of 2x4s, and waterproofing it, with roofing cement, tar, or a similar product. This box must be placed in a hole in dry well-drained ground as deep as possible. Put a layer of fist-sized rocks in the bottom for drainage, then cover with a sheet of plastic. Put the box on wooden spaces, set on the plastic, and fill the space around it with sand. Finally, allow at least a foot of earth and then the sod plug. Due to the size of the object, you should consider above-ground concealment. It is well known that metal reinforcing rod in concrete poured walls prevents effective searching, so look for a location that is near or behind such a wall. You've just heard an audiobook presentation of How to Bury Your Goods by Eddie the Wire, a small booklet originally published by Loom Panics Unlimited, and now re-released for free in audio and PDF format. If you'd like a revised, updated paperback edition, that does exist via Paladin Press, who acquired a number of Loom Panics books when they went defunct. Hence, why no paperback via Liberty under Attack Publications? 
Find the book for free by visiting bonupodcast.com slash berry. Again, bonupodcast.com slash berry to get this short, yet highly valuable work. To view our full catalog of books, ghost phones, ghost pads, apothecary items, canned goods, and more, just visit libertyunderattack.com. Liberty Under Attack Publications, share your story. Find your freedom.